We fail. We are going to be live. Okay. <clears throat> oh, good. The astronauts are back inside. Yay. That was one long spacewalk. Um, like the distance covered was tremendous. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, around and around and around the Earth, but seven hours. Well, and from one end of, from the center of the space station out to its furthest tippity tip. Oh, like how far out they had to go yeah. to actually be able to. Um, yeah. Anytime yeah. you exceed what the, the Canada arm lets you reach, it's kind of scary. So someone proposed, why don't, why doesn't Canada just make an arm that'll be able to take things to space? I can't think of a reason why that wouldn't work. One big long arm that just lifts things up through the atmosphere. I and think then, that might already have a different name and we're lap, lacking the needed carbon fiber. And then maybe just throw it. So it's like an arm that lifts some object up through the atmosphere and then throws it. Boom. You're in orbit now. <clears throat> Solved it. I'm I'm just Just you're just gonna you're just gonna go I'm along out. with this. Alright. I'm just I'm out. Uh and of course the the it's the uh sad anniversary of Alexei Leonov, who was the first person to spacewalk. So you get the first all female spacewalk going on this, as you say incredibly long distance spacewalk out to the ends of the station um, happened in the same week that Alexei Leonov passed away. So I'm sure he would have just thought it was the greatest. I'm going to say <laughs> Zap Van Zappen, like a really big trebuchet. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. My brain has just gone. No, it just noped out and went somewhere else in the house. I'm going to say hi to some people then. Hi to Andy Cowley and Bill Sugden and Bork Klankar and Carolyn B, Chai Latte Nebula, Christopher Senti, Dustin King, Esther Gagne, George Lancaster, Greg Nickel, Guido Bibra, Harry M, Hugo Burnham, James Aberson, Jessica Feltz, Jim Smith, John Suffield, Larry Beckham, Linda Sadiq, Nancy Graziano, Paranor, Raj Luthra, Rich901, Ricky Buxton, Sergusi, Sick James, Tom Van Scotter, and Zap Van Zappen. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, perfectly normal episode of Astronomy Cast. For those of you who are wondering what it on earth it is that you have stumbled into, this I'm Fraser, that's Pamela. We're going to record our 543rd episode of Astronomy Cast. Today we're going to be talking about the habitable zone is a lot weirder and more complicated than we ever thought uh, before. As our trip through weirdness continues. Hello, Daniel McCool, Obsidian Radio, John Drake, Greg Nickel. Now I've got you all. What? George Lancaster? Maybe? Pezzles or Powell? Pavel? Is it Pavel? Like, I think it's like from Star Trek. Pavel Zersky. I want to say hi to everyone who's co-watching over on patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. You... Yay to my Twitch tweets. Wait a second. You just said Patreon. Is that different from Twitch? Dang it. I'm just Englishing poorly today. No, I, hello to all of our Twitch followers over on twitch.tv slash Um Yay. Uh, yeah. I, I need to see the quote. They need any text from Twitch. I should get the Twitch chat going in front of me when we do the QA. Because okay. we want to, we want to be where you are. Um, I don't want to. We don't want to force people to go into just one thing or another. There you go. George Lancaster is watching on Twitch, and then commenting on YouTube. This is so weird. It's the future. You wanted to be in all the places at once, and we're working on it. <laughs> working on it. Yeah, exactly. Pavel Chersky. There we go. I will have trouble with the Chersky part, Pavel. I apologize in advance. The way it works, I don't know if this works for you, Pamela, but it's like, like if I don't get the pronunciation right my first time, it's gone. Forever. I will never get it right. I will struggle with the wrong one because my instinct, my default, is the one that I want to go with. Until and... I'm publicly humiliated, 
So, so I, public humiliation goes a long way with me. Yeah. If you call me out on my mispronunciation, uh, I, I will remember the shame. And that is apparently the hmm. way you teach me to pronounce things correctly. Really? See, I just double down. <laughs> if you, you think, think I, if I say globular cluster and we think it's hilarious, people think it's hilarious. Well, then, you know, I will find every place where you were taught to pronounce uh, globular cluster and I will make it get changed so that it is considered a valid pronunciation. I said Fresnel lens and people give me a hard time in a recent episode. Apparently, according to the internet, Fresnel and Fresnel are equally valid ways to pronounce Fresnel lens. I, I once got into a knockdown, drag out, shouting argument. I was a teenager at the time <laughs> over the pronunciation of Beetlejuice, Betelgeist, however you want to pronounce it, the dictionary says both are true. And I wanted to say Beetlejuice, expletive, expletive. Yeah, three times and at I least. Was, yeah, and I was informed that was utterly unacceptable. <laughs> there, there is a fight to the death. Um, Pavel, uh, see, I can't even do it. I'm going to say Ch Chersky. Yeah, so we don't have a CZ in Canadian. You never... You never pronounce, can you think of anything where you would pronounce the letters CZ or CZ? Czechoslovakia. Hmm? Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Ch -ch 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 Czech. Yeah, good point. All right. Like the country. Okay. Yes. All right. I'll give them that. Um, parent, I know it's, it's for now, or it might not be. Uh, what was the other one that people give me a hard time about? People give me a hard time about the way I say kilometer. How, how do you say it? Kilometer? Yeah, okay. So apparently that's the wrong way. That the right You're way- supposed to say kilometer? Is to say kilometer, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like, you know, millimeter, kiloliter, kilometer. But regional pronunciations, folks, they're well, real. That's the thing, right? It's like, yeah, like how English you... takes other languages down dark alleys and steals from yeah. them and then changes the yeah. pronunciations just a little bit. And at just least we bit. use the metric system in Canada. Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like we'll say we say lieutenant here. We and do if, not. Yeah, no, you say lieutenant. We say lieutenant. Because um, there's no F in. Lieutenant. I know, and yet well, I don't know. I don't know why we say it. It's a British thing, so we say it. And then, of course, the way I say Z. So, I mean, this is the thing, right? Is like I feel like when people are encountering other accents, other regional dialects for the like, is this like the first time you've experienced that other people say words in different ways? And so, like, what is the difference between a person who comes from Scotland and and has a way of pronouncing? oat words, you know, uh, or, or like book, how they, how a person from Scotland would pronounce book compared to the way, you know, we in Canada will pronounce about a boat. Right. So anyway, it's pretty funny to me that like there, like there is no right and there is no wrong way on like the, you just can't, there's no right way to pronounce words. Like, if you can get although the word will, across. Although. Uh, it will forever be a ski cap instead of a toque to me. I will admit sure, to well, that. By all means, there could be multiple terms for the same thing. Absolutely. You know, a Chesterfield. You know what a Chesterfield is? No idea. Yeah, it's a couch. But we call them Chesterfields. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so all I'm saying is that if you feel like you need to uh, fix somebody's pronunciation out there on the internet... Check for a second and ask yourself, is this a, is this absolutely the wrong pronunciation? Like saying, you know, Frasier, like that's wrong, right? Obviously. Unless it's the park that has a Z-I-E-R in its yeah, no, spelling. F yeah, if there's a Z and an I in there, feel free to say Z, Z. But, you know, if it's an S-E-R, so Fraser is the only proper pronunciation. But for every other word, literally in the entire English language, it's really, it's very flexible. Daniel McCool, Canada, where language is drunk. <laughs> um, if, if anyone hasn't, I highly... Oh, there you go. Esther Gagne is saying they call them Chesterfields in France, too. <laughs> Justin King says, Chesterfield, I think you're making this up. Um, uh, I highly recommend you watch Letter Kenny. 
which will give you a, a and that's like central Canada language. So funny. Such a funny show. All right. What, why are we here? What do we do again? I, I think we might podcast. Okay, let's maybe. do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm ready to press record when you are. I lost my intro. Okay. That's right. I was so sick of that Google Sites page. Hold on. I We will replace it. I closed trauma. it. And then I burned it. <laughs> Okay. Please don't burn it. That would burn like, how, the internet down. How would down. I burn it? We got, like I go to Google's home office and light a server on fire. Like no. I said, that would burn the internet down. Yeah. All right. Here we go. I'm going to press record. I am not recording on the correct device. No. I'm okay. sorry. Two one. Hold on. I have no clue. Oh, it's because I was traveling. That's why. Okay. I'm pressing record. Whoa, I'm echoing in my ears. Let's try this one more time. One more time, people. I hate everything. Okay. Hello. It is recording and the audio looks healthy. Right on. Me too. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 543, Weird Issues, The Habitable Zone. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Great. What's new? Uh, it suddenly became fall. It it went from in the 90s Fahrenheit to in the 50s mm -hmm. in the two weeks that I was away. And I feel like I missed a season in there and I would have enjoyed it. Yeah, all the leaves turned to uh, brown and yellow. And then we had a big storm come in and it just threw them all off the tree. So we normally you get like a couple of weeks of like really nice leaves, but we've just had storm after storm. And so every leaf that's uh, on the trees, it's all just down already. So I, here comes the raking and the, you know, and the wheelbarrowing to clean off the lawn. Adulting is hard. <laughs> yeah, it really is. All right, our series on universe weirdness marches on. This week, we take a look at the habitable zone and how things aren't as simple as we once thought. All right, Pamela, I, I, sort of the same game we've been playing every week. Uh, you head back 10 years. I asked 10, 10 years ago, Pamela, um, what is the habitable zone? I would have said that you take a sun-like star and assume that those are the only kinds of stars that can have Earth-like <laughs> planets. Right. And then you find that area, uh, the correct distance from the star that water is allowed to exist as a water. Um, and it isn't too hot that it evaporates it and it isn't too cold that it freezes it. And in that region of the solar system where planets can have liquid water there and only right. there. There's where you might find life. Exactly. Right. It might be on a moon, but if it's on a moon, we're whoa, talking whoa, whoa. Endor. Earth-sized world. We're talking Endor. Yeah, but Earth, okay, Endor fine, could fine. be Earth-sized. Orbiting around a gas giant. Okay, great. Yes. All right. And so that was the, you know, that narrowed the search criteria down to sun-like stars, Earth-sized worlds. Fine. They can orbit a gas giant within a very specific region where liquid water can be present on the surface of a planet. That's it. Exoplanet hunters, go. How's that changed? Uh, we kind of took all of it and threw it out a window. <laughs> we sure did. Um, <laughs> so then, you know, when astronomers think about the habitable zone today, what what are all the factors? I mean, it's really it's like habitability places. I mean, is there even like a better term than habitable zone, habitable oh, zones? Uh, well, the, the ridiculous thing is that it's hard to kill off language and so the phrase habitable zone continues to get used even when it makes no sense. So we've had two different things happen. The first thing that we've had happen is the realization that you can have red dwarf planets that have around them this 
set of radii where liquid water is allowed to exist. But if you put a planet in that region, it is going to tidally lock itself to its star so that only one side is ever facing that star. And that particular world is likely to have a particular hellstorm of winds with a single cellular catastrophe of wind blowing from one side of the world over to the other side of the world life is highly unlikely well so yeah i mean that's only part of it though right i mean being snuggled up close to a flaring red dwarf star is also a bad day Right. Well, we think that they only flare for a few billion years and in the fullness of time, maybe a world that has been completely irradiated and broiled and burnt by that misbehaving red dwarf. Maybe things can happen that make it wet and happy again. But even if it survives and even if water comes back when it's stable later, it's still going to be tidally locked. Nothing is taking that tidal locking away. So I normally I take everything you say and I agree and, and go along, but I actually had a chance to do a video on this subject and I talked to an exoplanet researcher and he, from um, McGill University and sort of this is his specialty and he was saying that actually tidally locked planets are are looking now like they're not as bad as people thought as long as they have deep oceans. And so okay. what you're going to get is you're going to get deep oceans that are going to very efficiently move the warm move this overly hot sun baked, uh, you know, temperature through the air and through the especially through the water and circulate it with currents to the to the far side of the ocean. And so the front side of the planet will be more like a jungle. And the back side of the planet will be more like Antarctica. And, but and so the but, thing I want to point out with this is is to get those kinds of deep oceans, you have to have a massive amount of asteroid strikes and comet strikes after the red dwarf is done with oh yeah it. for sure but yeah. but but now with like before like again if we were talking three years ago say tidally locked that's it death knell for the planet. You, you might have this tiny little region around the edges but actually half of the planet is jungle like and then the other half is arctic but, but in in the special case of a massive heavy bombardment occurring midway through the life of the the solar yeah. system yeah, yeah you take an earth-sized world you put it beside a red dwarf star and you're going to get what you know w that is like the earth with the amount of water that the earth has you're going to get half the planet jungle half the planet arctic and it's so it's so actually you could have life all the way around on that on that front side that's all just just adding that to the toolbox <laughs> that is cool i totally didn't know that um yeah, it's we keep trying to use computers to find exceptions and it turns out they keep existing. And and this is the whole problem with habitable zones is these exceptions keep being found to exist. And this includes our own solar system. And one of the things that we've been saying over and over in recent years on this show is and now it looks like and this moon might be able to have life. And I'm not sure if we started with Titan or Europa, but those are the two worlds where all of this got started. With Titan, I, it was initially noticed that the methane appeared to uh, be out of balance and there were other chem chemical uh, signatures that were out of balance with equilibrium. Now the methane out of balance with equilibrium simply means it's being produced somewhere, sunlight breaks down methane, the fact that we continue to see methane on Titan means something continues to produce methane on Titan. But the other chemistry that was noticed uh, means that there's something going on that is driving ongoing uh, chemical reactions on the surface of the world that the easiest explanation is respiration. But that's very uncomfortable. That's very, very uncomfortable. So most people are like, mm, we're just going to assume there's chemistry we don't understand going on. Right. And so, so from Titan, where we see liquid methane filling the role that water forms here on earth we can jump over to enceladus where we don't even have to replace the water you have the water 
via means that we hadn't expected in the past. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I had an itch in my throat that just was killing me. Um, so, so as we, we look at Europa, we're finding that this world is tidally stretched and compacted as it gets, well, thrown around by the moons of Jupiter and Jupiter itself. And this constant contracting and compressing has the effect of heating its core. And that heat is driving a liquid ocean that may be only a couple of kilometers beneath an icy surface shell that protects that water from radiation and all the other brutalities of space. And so when you think about places like Enceladus, it's possible that there is some, as you said, there's something similar on on Europa, there's probably something similar on Ganymede and Callisto, probably Triton, uh, possibly Pluto and and uh, Sharon, um, there's uh, but, you know, Eris, I mean, it's possible that there are hundreds of worlds, depending on how big the solar system is and what's out there, that could be that could have some amount of liquid water under their surface under some kind of icy shell. And so instead of saying, Oh, the habitable zone is this place, the habitable zones are that place where the, um, you know, where where the liquid water can exist on the surface, or any world that has a lot of ice. So once you get outside the frost line, then there's a whole bunch more habitable zones. And even this story has been radically evolving over the past few years. We, we settled into the idea of, well, we see geysers at Enceladus. We think we have evidence of geysers at Europa that's now much more confirmed. Mm -hmm. So we're willing to believe liquid water is there. And... Well, it's a harder argument for Enceladus, we can explain this through tidal features of squishing and contracting. Okay, fine. But we still expected Pluto to be completely dead. Nope. And then New Horizons got there and New Horizons was like, huh, okay, this world is nothing like what we expected. And it appears to have who knows what's driving it geology that is causing recurring well not plate tectonics but ice tectonics to be a feature on its surface it's i mean it's such a neat idea and and when you think about when we think about say the future of of the earth and as the sun heats up and as it boils off the oceans in a billion years from now and even as the sun dies these worlds are going to be around again for for billions and billions, trillions of years and could be still warm inside from the decaying radioactive elements and, and whatever tidal forces are going on for a long time after the, the, the solar system, you know, the sun has died, the earth on the surface. So in fact, these places could be the last places that we find life in the universe as well. And this gets to the other side of, of how we understand habitability. Initially, when we thought of habitability, we didn't just assume that you had to have liquid water, but we also assumed you had to have sunlight. So when we were children, we were taught that life requires sunlight, air, nutrients. And, and it didn't have to be like air like you and I breathe. It could be oxygen that is in water that fish are respirating out of the water. Then as we began to explore the Marianas Trench and the volcanic features that exist in the deep ocean, we found vast teeming life in all kinds of absurd diversity around these volcanic vents, indicating that life totally didn't need sunlight. That, that was just not a requirement, so let's get rid of that. Instead, say you need a thermal gradient of some sort. And now, as we explore more and more with mines, with uh, ice samples, with even looking at the surroundings of radiation spills, we aren't finding environments where life isn't willing to exist. Right. Yeah. Life can life, uh, as they say, finds a way. Um, so then, you know, but there are I mean, the red we talked about the red dwarf stars. 
So, so let's examine some of the other kinds of stars as you go up the, the spectrum. Is there like a sweet spot for the size of your star? I mean, I mean, like the red dwarf stars, they're going to last for 10 trillion years, but they, they may very well flare away all of the heavy metals and make the planets unlivable before they settle down. A star like our sun is really only going to provide us on the surface, say 2 billion years of animals walking around total time. Is there like a sweet spot in between? We're still figuring these things out. This is one of the things that we're hoping to be able to solve with spacecraft like TESS. The problem is we, we don't know what is the frequency that different size stars actually have planets. The Kepler mission looked out at a cone of space. It looked at a single field on the sky. It looked at it for a long period of time. And when you look at a single field on the sky, you're sampling a small volume nearby and a progressively larger and larger volume at greater and greater distances. Well, at greater distances, you're looking at brighter stars. And so it didn't give us a complete sample of this is how frequently red dwarf stars, this is how frequently the mid temperature stars, this is how frequently sun like stars. We need to understand what is the likelihood that a star of any given size is going to have planets. And then it's, it's not quite the Drake equation, but it's, it's going to be a modification to that Drake equation where you take the size of the star, in this case, the initial mass function, what is the, the ratio of stars at a different size one to the other, and then you can evolve it with what is the likelihood of stars of each of those sizes having planets. And that new convolution is going to be what tells us how many planets are out there and that in turn allows us to say, okay, these stars last for this amount of time. Right. Let's convolve it again and take into account the fact that, well, red dwarfs have a terrible childhood and bigger stars only live a short period of time and get at that duration that a civilization could exist. Yeah. I mean, now, I can imagine like if you have a star that's maybe a little smaller than the sun, like a... I don't know what the classification is that's below what the sun is. We're a G2. K star. A K star. Yeah. So you've got a K star. Like they're going to last double the length or 70 billion years and they're going to be less intense, but maybe they still will be fairly flary in the, in the beginning and then settle. And maybe there'll be other reasons. So anyway, so, and then what about stars that are bigger and hotter than the sun? Like, you and, know, and this is where it comes down to trying to figure out how fast can life possibly evolve? We, we are now finding, thanks to strombolites in Western Australia, that life already had appeared on Earth in the form of bacterial mats three and a half billion years ago. So that's a billion and a half years into our solar system's existence. We like, we're finally a solid object when these right. satellites were getting formed. Now, while there are stars that don't live to see a billion years. Um, could it be that these significantly shorter lived stars, these stars that are only three or four billion years in age, have the potential to quick start life and end up because they evolve so quickly, in turn evolving life quickly? We don't know these things. And these are more questions to ask. We used to think that massive stars couldn't have planets and well kelp 9b is out there going nope we we've got them kelp yeah. 9b is this this fabulous little fricasseed world that its surface temperature on the side facing its very very hot star well that surface temperature matches the surface temperature of our sun right yeah it's not that baked. world we don't want to go to that world no that yeah. world bad yeah bad world bad well with this idea that that life could have we don't know how long life takes to form and yet here in the solar system here on on earth life formed it feels like literally the moment that it could like yes this, as soon as there was like one spot that had cooled down and wasn't 
on fire anymore than life found a way. And there's this great idea, and this was proposed by Avi Loeb. I don't know if you've heard this idea before, that, that in the early universe, at around 8 million years after the Big Bang, the average temperature of the entire universe was around, say, 20 degrees Celsius. So it was, it, was, it was room temperature, the entire universe. I hadn't thought of that, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. And so all water in the universe would have been liquid everywhere. Wow. And so you can imagine this moment early on where all where life could have gotten gotten going and then few a few million years later everything cooled down to the point that it all froze. And I uh, it's such a neat idea. It's you know, I don't know if there's any way to test it or anything, but still, it's a super cool idea. Well, just that idea that you could have had for this brief epoch a, a great flourishing. I mean, that would have been the moment for panspermia to take off. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyway, it's, you know, again, it's like, Oh, there's so science. much science fiction I know, it's that I now wish I had fiction. the ability to write. I know, I know, I know. It's great. You, I'll like, send you the paper. It's uh, it's a, such a great oh. idea. It's called the, the Habitable Epic or the Habitable Era or something like that of the universe. Um, I can imagine if they just got to trilobites at that period and like. Yeah put trilobites in the entire solar, in the entire yeah. universe. Swimming and... across the universe, yeah. It, it's a Star Trek discovery yeah, really waiting is. to happen. Um, so then even just this idea now of the, ha like, you know, before the habitable zone was really all we considered when we thought about is a planet habitable or not. And now I think even that idea is more complicated, right? Like we now have a lot more factors that go into what whether we think a planet is going to be habitable or not. And and so now what we're looking at is things like we are pretty sure the surface of Mars is not habitable because the surface is getting constantly hit with high energy radiation. And this isn't the kind of radiation that bacteria likes to eat. This is the kind of radiation that blasts part DNA in an unrelenting manner. So here, if you want to have life on Mars, you need to get beneath the surface. And, and the, the next topic we're going to take on is actually astrobiology and how we look for life signatures and the quandaries that we've yes. had looking for life on Mars. Now, as, as we consider where is there a habitable place, we, we need to consider, do you have protection from ionizing radiation? Well, under the ice of Enceladus, under the ice of Europa, under the ice of, of Ganymede, of Ceres, yes, you have protection from that radiation. So then the next question is, do you have nutrients? And we're finding organic molecules just about everywhere. And there's a new release coming out that is explaining that you can get complex organic molecules, uh, these polycyclic hydrocarbons, just by taking normal carbon hydrogen atoms, acetylene, and blasting them with galactic radiation. So the existence of carbon and hydrogen together in the presence of that deadly radiation can create the organic molecules we need for life. Yeah. It's kind of twisted. Well, and so, I mean, the thing with with all of that, right, is like, I think 10 years ago, again, we would have said, if you want to have a world to be habitable, it's got to be in the habitable zone. It's got to have large amounts of water and it's got to have rock and, you know, other elements that are required. But now it almost feels like it's gone more general again, like because they're fine, as you said, you know, you're finding the the raw materials in a different shape at Enceladus than you do on Earth. You've got protection from radiation from space. On Earth, it's our atmosphere and the magnetosphere, but on Enceladus, it's ice. You've got water. On Earth, it's liquid on the surface. And Enceladus, it's under a big, thick ice shell. You've got the food for life on Earth, you know, photosynthesis plants on Enceladus. Maybe it's hydrogen gas dissolves in the ocean. You've got, and so I think that that it's almost like like a, astronomers got too specific 
about what they wanted, what sort of the way they thought that should be constructed. And now and it's here almost I like, think we have to blame the biologists. Yeah, maybe. And, but then you have to kind of go take one step back now and just kind of go back to first principles about this, right? Solvent energy source. Nutrient. Yeah. Right? And it's Raw materials. Be, it, it's going to come down to what is the probability of a given environment having life. Now, the key question that we still haven't answered at all is how hard is it to create life? Now, we know that if there is a place you can have life on Earth, it has life on Earth. We know that if there's a place you think there isn't life on Earth, there's probably life on Earth. Um, we've kind of got life literally coming out our ears because even we are covered in microbes that aren't of our literally own Literally coming out of our ears, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of gross to think about. Uh, again, not a wet scientist. I deal with stars. Uh, <laughs> and, super, so, and super death volcanoes. <laughs> it's true. No, you're a hobbyist uh, on that. You're, you're just yeah. an amateur, yeah. But uh, as as we look out, we don't know if we are unique we don't know if life often evolves at this single cellular level. We don't know if it very easily goes from single cell to multi celled bacterial mats. There are hints on Mars of seeing features that look like stromatolites. I, we don't know if the first squishy flagellin wielding life that we found here on Earth had a chance to, well, flagellate its way through the waters of Europa. We need to answer these questions. Yeah. But it's like, it's kind of exciting. Like on the one hand, the possibilities have totally opened up. And then on the other hand, the possibilities have nothing. totally opened up. <laughs> and so we got too many places to look now, but it's really exciting. And so next week, we're going to talk about how do we look uh, for life and and how this ant has, has actually gotten a lot more complicated than we ever thought. And it got, it got weird. It got weird. Yes. That is an accurate, yeah. accurate description. Uh, do you have any names for us this week, I Pamela? I do. So as a reminder, we are made possible by all of you out there listening right now. Uh, it is your donations through Patreon in particular and also through PayPal that really support us. And this week, we'd like to thank Tim Garish, Frederick Shorga, uh, Gregory Joyner, Thomas Toopman, Eric Franiger, William Andrews, Dwayne Isaac, Shannon Humber, David Gates, Ryan James, Kislenia Penflienko, Rachel Fry, Darcy Daniels, Kristen Brooks, Dean, Dan Littman, Martin Dawson, Jason Samansky, and Russell Peto. Thank you. We are here. Thanks to your support. Thanks, Pamela. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Okay, and now we save. 543. Okay. I'm sorry that Stella was trying to distract you. She she did a great job. I, I don't know if if it, she was cropped out of camera, but for those of you who didn't notice, my puppy decided that she was going to come up and poke me with her little nose and then stick her face up on camera and be exceedingly adorable. Obsidian Radio says, that sucks. So it's not possible to create a future Mars colony, or maybe we could build deep underground cities on Mars. Underground cities on Mars, that is the direction to go. You can also find a crater and build a cap over it. That is also effective. Babylon 5 had it all right. Yeah. Except for the shadows. Don't go digging shadows up on Mars. That's bad. <laughs> right. But the, the gist being, if you want to live on Mars, live underground. And then you're fine. True. All right. Hit us with your questions. Um, on Twitch, journey started. If you're looking for a new home, would spending the time to travel to a red dwarf, tidally locked planet be worth it due to the predicted life cycle of the star? 
Uh, only if you know a priori that that world has a bunch of liquid water. So, so the reason that I'm particularly hung up on that is we know that young angry stars will bake worlds completely dry. Yeah. Our own world was once baked dry, we think. There's alternative theories out there. There's always alternative theories. Uh, but it's presumed that the reason that we have water now is during the period of heavy bombardment from 3.2 to 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, sorry, to 4.2 billion years ago, there was a lot of water brought to the surface of our planet through meteorite strikes and comets, mostly meteorite strikes, it's looking like. Now, that era of heavy bombardment is probably something that only happens once unless your solar system has a close pass with another solar system and has a lot of disruption occur. So if you have a star that spends a significant period of time going through its terrible twos, you're not going to have that era of heavy bombardment to bring you all the liquid you need to reestablish the habitability of your world. Right. So the question becomes, do these worlds that have that second era of heavy bombardment that brings you that water you need after the star goes through its terrible twos, are those out there? And the other piece of interesting research that came out was astronomers saw some really powerful solar winds on a red dwarf star like early on. And they were watching these almost uh, pressure waves, these waves were moving through the star system. And so the thought is, in fact, they were stripping away some of even the heavier elements. So you might get this situation where like really early on, you've just got like a like it's like a I don't know like a leaf blower coming off of the star and it just is getting rid of every piece of raw material that you you would want so you've got this to get through the star trying to just get rid of all of the raw materials and then you've got to deal with the star irradiating everything that's nearby and then you've got a nice long time and we just we just don't know if if it will withstand it. And yeah, this this is where you can end up with a solar system filled with mercuries. Novaya Zemla effect says, do we build robots to build homes new on Mars effect. or humans? What? <laughs> that's what that, that means new star effect. Oh, cool. Nova Zemla. Yeah, you, that's your that's your secret power is speaking Russian. Um, so do we spend, send robots to build homes on Mars or humans? Well, I think you send them so that they're pretty much self-assembling. You don't necessarily need robots in some cases. Uh, I'm sure some of you out there have seen the new tents that you just sort of toss them and they expand out to be their best tenty self. Yep. Uh, I, I think we basically just need to send something that happily 3D prints away, nice little bubble habitats. Um I don't know if you call that a robot or simply yeah. an automated 3D printer at that point. It's definitely not intelligent, um, but it gets the job done. I saw a neat design. They were like, they were like cubes. And mm -hmm. so the, 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 in the spacecraft, the lander is this cube and maybe it inflates a bit. And then the cubes stack beside each other bit by bit. And so you end up with just a larger and larger, it's almost like Lego blocks, just getting yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger on the ground. But, but I think that, that Larry Beckham wants me to point to the poster. Why can I not point to the poster? There you go. Hey, do we go to Mars? Gravity wells are for suckers. Don't go into gravity wells. One of the, the, one of the worst things that ever happened to you is you were born in a gravity well. It's true. Yeah. We need to get out of this gravity well. It's a trap. Um, but yeah, like, and there's some really amazing research that's just happening by many groups about ways that you can build 3D printed structures out of lunar regolith or Martian regolith, yeah. and you can just turn them into various forms of concrete. But a lot of the time, I think in the beginning, it's going to be going underground. You're going to go into a lava tube and you're going to hunker down and you're going to put a lid over the top of the entrance, pressurize the inside, and you've got a huge pocket that you can live in where the temperatures are better the you're away from the the radiation um so i think that's that's where we're probably going to see the first places happen uh 
not a lot of questions today. So maybe we need some kind of argument or something. <laughs> what do we disagree about? Uh, Glancaster on Twitch says, can an orbiting moon of a Jovian, super Jovian type planet orbiting a red dwarf support life? And wouldn't a moon in such an arrangement not be tidally locked to the red dwarf? I, so there you could have it at a significantly greater distance away from the red dwarf than what we're talking about. So uh, you take an icy moon, not different from the icy moons our Jupiter has, put them in a more distant orbit around that red dwarf star, and you can have that tidally created environment. Now, the caveat on all of this is that uh, with one exception, we so far aren't finding massive planets around baby stars because gravitationally, the, the infalling material capable of fo forming a red dwarf star, there's not enough of it left over to make massive Jovian type planets. The one exception that we found so far looks like it may have formed the way you end up with a binary star forming, except you have a Jupiter and a right. red dwarf. Um, so while you can have that kind of situation, the likelihood is extremely low. Mon John movies. If we found a food source on another planet that had the opposite DNA to ours, could we eat it? I guess they're asking about the chirality, right? Like, like, right. Could we so, eat? so molecules can have different bends. So you can either have everything follow a right hand rule or a left hand rule. In, in how you have your molecular angles. Um, this is chirality, chirality. I don't know how you pluralize the, not, it's not even, English is not my thing today. Uh, but uh, in some cases, um, just this slight change can take something from being healthy for your body to being toxin to your body. It can take it from having calories to not having calories. Uh, so finding a world where all the DNA had the opposite, well, molecular bend. Um, it's unclear, but I, I suspect that it would not necessarily be good for us. <laughs> Kylie Cerna asks, if life on another planet is basically just bacteria, how would we find it? This is where we start getting into respiration questions. Yeah, like this and is next week's episode. Yeah, so this this is the situation that we're looking at with Titan, where we look at its atmosphere and certain molecules don't seem to be in chemical equilibrium with each other, which tells us that there is something driving reactions. Uh, this is when we look at world's atmospheres and we see an excess of methane, we see an excess of oxygen. Um, life is chemistry. And we are ongoing chemical reactions and we change our environment through our chemical reactions. Paranor is saying that lemon and orange flavor is the same molecule, but opposite chirality. I do not know that. I did. I was not aware of that. That is fascinating. <laughs> Iron Heart, lost I'm... YouTube going over to Twitch. Okay, so there you go. That's why we have the backup, I guess. Um, Bill Sugden asks, how does the metallicity of a star determine the formations of the planets and life? Is are you going, happen? are you now going down the chirality rabbit hole? It, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So, uh, orange and lemon peel both contain a molecule called lemonine. However, the lemonine molecule and orange peels, um, and lemon are structured differently that, and that causes the, the difference in, in smell and taste. So, okay. I learned something. I'm right. excited. So there you go. Eat up all that. But, but I, I mean, when you eat food, I mean this, we are so far out of our specialty now, but when you eat food, I mean, are you really, I mean, you're eating the proteins, you're eating the carbohydrates, but I mean, are you really is your body really processing the it at a DNA level or the DNA forming the proteins and the fats well, and the carbohydrates, right? And the, that's just what you're eating. So, so the, the concern that I have about, uh, the, the chirality, however you say that word of, of DNA, like if an entire world, all of the, the, adenosine, your, all of those different mm -hmm. molecules that make up DNA, if all of them had the reverse uh, 
structure, they would form um, molecules, proteins in particular, that aren't the same. And the way we live is we need certain proteins mm -hmm, to build mm -hmm. our muscles. And, and so if those proteins don't match what our bodies need, our bodies won't get the nutrients, yeah. the proteins, the, 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 the building blocks of life from these alien bent differently yeah. molecules. Um, so let's go back to Bill's uh, question. Uh, can, uh, sorry, uh, does the, how does the metallicity of a star determine the formation of the planets in life? Well, you have an entire cloud of material that the solar system is built out of. And it's that cloud of material that is going to have a, a specific ratio of hydrogen to helium to heavier elements. If you don't have those heavier elements, you don't get planets that have heavier elements. And the star is made out of a sampling of that initial cloud and it grabs what it can and then redistributes the rest of the molecules by pushing on them with its solar wind. This was initially thought to be why you end up with gas giants and ice giants in the outer solar system with their hydrogen and helium rich atmospheres. It's now less clear exactly uh, how much the hydrogen and helium get completely cleared out rather than turned into local gas giants versus mm -hmm. gas giants that formed fallout migrate inwards. These are things we don't really understand yet. Um, but the the more heavy elements are in that initial cloud the more heavy elements will be in the star that is formed and that will be available to form rocky and metal rich worlds it's almost like i mean there is like a habitable zone to the milky way yes we're, we're still making sense of this i so the idea is that across our galaxy when you look at globular clusters these are extremely old pockets of stars they don't have a lot of metals as far as we know they don't have any planets uh when you get too close into the center of our galaxy things just get to be a furry mess and you probably don't have a lot of stability there's this sweet spot where you don't have a lot of interactions and you do have a lot of metals and we're in that sweet spot these are the places where we expect to find solar systems with the long-term stability capable of forming, maintaining, and not disrupting their worlds. But then, of course, this is our assumption. So don't be shocked and surprised. If 10 years from now. Yeah, when in 10 years from now, we start finding all kinds of, of planets around incredibly low metal stars. And then, and then at that point, you're just like, I, you know, you give up. Yeah. Um, Chai Latte Nebula asks, can moons have tectonic plates or are they always too small to have them? Don't know. Uh, so, so this comes down to also how do you define moon? If moon is simply how you define an object going around something that isn't a star, this means that you could presumably have an Earth-sized object going around a super Jupiter. I don't know how likely that is, but it's possible. Uh, you certainly have larger than Mercury sized moons going around our own gas giants. Now, the, the plate tectonics of our world are driven by the fact that we're large enough that we trapped a lot of heat inside and we have a lot of water that allows the plates to slip and slide. Venus didn't have that, for instance. So is it possible? Sure. Is it likely? No idea. Mm -hmm. And and it's in that difference between possibility and likelihood that we don't know if it actually happened. So there was a paper that came out this week. I don't know if you saw it, where they were talking about the habitable size for planets as sort of a no, modification. I didn't see that one. Yeah. So a habitable zone size. And so yeah. you can have, a, say, an Earth sized world, a Venus sized world, a Mars sized world, and they can remain habitable. And as soon as you go be below a certain mass of your world, yeah. then it can't hold on to its water because it just yes. doesn't have enough mass. And so say Ganymede, if you put Ganymede to at the same place as the Earth, even if it was covered in in water, the sun would would blast away all of its all of its water. So there is a and kind of a minimum surface size. Surface stability. 
yeah. surface habitability, right. not subsurface habitability. Right, right. This, this is surface habitability. And so you could see these worlds. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess if Ganymede had all of its water blown away, it also wouldn't have subsurface water. Um, well, not necessarily. If it was this close to the sun. Well, yeah, that's true. Mercury did get yeah. baked pretty, pretty um, hard. And so, but I mean, I think that this idea that, that these smaller, I mean, if these worlds are smaller, they will be, they will have sort of uh, cooled down and solidified. And so they're not going to have the, this is part of the problem with Mars. And this is probably yeah. the problem with the moon is they're just too small. They um, got too small and solidified and, yeah. and so then the plate tectonics ceased. Although what happened with um, Venus. with Venus, right? Yeah. So so Venus, one of the best guesses out there that I think still, and again, not my niche field. So, yeah. um, but in in my astronomer, not planetary scientist opinion, um, my favorite theory is that uh, Venus had some massive uh, outgassing, outheating event that that was planet wide volcanism and uplift that just released a giant burp and yeah i mean the whole planet the just, just turned itself inside out yeah and so it released all of that locked carbon just in one fell swoop and then instead of slowly gobbling it back up and pulling it back underground it just didn't it and became it just, death. And it, and it died. Yeah. This yeah. world is death incarnate. And it's funny. Um, there's sort of like two thinkings, two thoughts about this. One is that it did this. It was never habitable. It was always a, a dumpster fire death. right from the beginning. And then the other idea is that, in fact, if it hadn't done this, this turning itself inside out, it could be habitable to this day if it had. And that's just amazing. Reason, reasonable amounts of water and atmosphere. And so, again, like what is the habitable zone, right? Um, well, and the crazy thing about that latter theory with Venus is they think that as recently as three million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And we had all sorts of life three million years right. ago. Because they don't see any. They just don't see craters on the surface of Venus. Yeah. And so you would expect to see some large amount. I mean, we've got to go back. I think that's like, that's the bottom line. We've got to go back yeah. and we've got to do it right. All right. One last question. Uh, third rock astronomy with the estimated 400 billion stars at even 10% chance of planets around those stars. Wouldn't that make 4 billion possible planets in our galaxy? I mean, right now it looks like it's hundred percent of stars have planets. There are more planets mm -hmm. than stars. Of metal rich stars mm -hmm. have planets. So so there is a metallicity effect. But yeah, once you have enough metals, it appears you just have planets. That's just the way the universe yeah. lets you form. Uh, so the question starts to become not how common are planets, they're common. Yeah. It starts to be how hard or easy is it for life to form. And in our solar system, with all the different objects, with all the different ecosystems and lack of ecosystems that we have, it starts to be possible to answer that question of how hard or easy is it for life to form. We just need to figure out how to do it without potentially killing all that life, yeah. which is a different problem. Yeah. All right. We've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching with us. Thanks to the moderators. Thanks to... Uh, Susie for helping with all the production and Nancy and Nightbot um, and everybody watching on Twitch. So glad to have you all there. All 100,000, 5 million. I don't know how many people wish. are watching us on Twitch right now. Um, but I'm really glad that uh, we were able to provide you with the viewing experience that uh, works best for you. Uh, what have you got coming up that's, that's happening shortly? Uh, I am going to be attending QCon in San Francisco at the beginning of November. In December, uh, Susie, Annie, and I are all going to be going down to the launch of a Falcon 9, oh. taking a cargo uh, up to the International Space Station. And I have this 
desperate hope that they decide to do the abort test while we're there because they haven't announced the dates yet. Right. So it's a non-zero probability at this point. So the abort test for Dragon or for yeah, SLS for, or for Crew Dragon. For Crew Dragon. Oh, that'd be amazing. That would be absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so there will be some sort of a meetup. We haven't sorted the details yet. Um, so if you're looking for a launch to attend and you want to ha informally have a let's go do this together, it's the December right CRS launch. Um, there is a transit of Mercury coming up in November. I think we're going to try and live stream it. Um, yeah. And our, and you're going to like our next video on over on my YouTube channel, Pamela, uh, which is I argue that people won't freak out about the discovery of life in the universe because we've already discovered life in the universe many times. Like oh. the surface, of, you know, the Mars, the Viking experiments, the Mars meteorite rock, the wow signal, the canals on Mars. Like we found life. We were wrong, but we so found intelligent it. life, though. Well, I think there will that be was the Mars canals. That was the canals on Mars. So we found okay. intelligent life, so, desperate Martians okay. trying to save whatever water they could have. And then they invaded the earth <laughs> on Halloween in 1938. So, And if folks out there want another podcast, we have another podcast. It's called The Daily Space. Yeah. We are only about 10 minutes a day. Perfect. So join me and uh, Annie Wilson, and we'll give you a quick rundown of all that is new in space and astronomy. And then go do a deep dive over on Universe Today. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. I'm going to wait. Then I'm going to stop it.